Okay, we're recording. So good afternoon, good evening everyone. Welcome back to my video cast. Um, this is my fourth episode and I'm really happy to be joined by Manira Wilson. Manira is the Member of Parliament for Twickenham. Before she went into politics, she has had a long career in business and has done uh, various work for organisations such as Save the Children. Uh, after leaving university, she joined EY and she read modern and medieval languages. Is, is, am I getting that right? It's, it's quite That's actually right. remarkable <laughs> at, uh, at, at the University of Cambridge. So, uh, Manira, thank you very much for joining me on a, on a sunny Saturday. I apologise for ruining your weekend. <laughs> No, it's okay. I've spent some time in the sun today, so that's okay. Okay, so I can be forgiven. <laughs> so I suppose, I mean, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of kick off with um, back, back at kind of school transitioning into university. So um, you went to the University of Cambridge um, between 1996 to, to 2000. Because you studied, um, like I said, modern and medieval languages, French and German. Had you always known that you, that's what you were going to do? You, did you aim to end up at Cambridge? Were you always wanting to study languages? Like, kind of take me back to the Minera back then. Oh, wow. Uh, that's a long, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, no, I was, um, I, I was never one of these people who thought, oh, wow, uh, I'd love to go to Cambridge and made it my aim to go to Cambridge. Um, it was actually thanks to my form tutor and politics teacher actually at A-level um, who said to me oh you should think about uh, applying to either Oxford or Cambridge and I'm shocked I never ever thought that I was uh, academic enough intelligent enough to go yeah. to one of the top two universities in the country um, so in terms of where I, I would end up no that was ne never part of some big grand plan it was um, you know, I, I was very fortunate that I went to a grammar school um, and therefore I was always pushed really hard and therefore able to achieve, you know, a, at a high standard. Um, and I think, you know, being in that very competitive uh, environment where we were pushed very hard meant that I probably got better academic grades than I might otherwise have done um, yeah. when I think about my academic development because actually I struggled to pass the entrance exam I was on the waiting list I only just made it in on appeal and in my first couple of years I, I, I did struggle a bit um, and then suddenly from my sort of third year onwards I started to flourish academically um, and I think you know if I'd gone somewhere else would I necessarily have done so well you know I'll never know but I you know I, I owe a lot to the school that I went to and the tutor that said go for Cambridge as far as languages goes I mean I always enjoyed languages my eldest sister so I'm the youngest of three uh, my eldest sister studied uh, French and European studies at universities at, at university and because she's nine years older than me there's quite a big age difference so she was always sort of sharing some of that with me and and and, and I was picking up bits of French from her anyway at home uh, before I started secondary school and then I just seemed to do very well in languages. Um, I loved French. I didn't love German so much, but unfortunately at Cambridge, if you wanted to study languages, you had to study two languages. You couldn't combine it with anything else. So I, I ended up, because I'd done French and German at A-level, my school didn't offer Spanish, otherwise I would quite like to have done something like, like Spanish. Mm -hmm. I ended up doing French and German by default, just because I was keen to do languages, and that was the option at Cambridge. Mm. And at Cambridge, so obviously it's interesting because Individuals will have their own judgment about, you know, settling into a, the Oxbridge group. What was, what was your experience like? Because it's always interesting uh, hearing from individuals that have studied at Cambridge or Oxford. Someone else on my video cast a few weeks ago went, went to Oxford and, and he actually commented about the fact that there is this perception that, you know, you arrive and it, it is nerve wracking and etc. But like, what was your take? Because I appreciate that for everyone it's not the same. Oh goodness, I felt like a complete imposter, um, both yeah. academically and socially. Mm -hmm. um, so although uh, both of my sisters had gone to university, so I wasn't the first in my family, um, I didn't know anybody else uh, close to me who'd been to Oxbridge. Um, and I certainly, I mean, the but one of the first things you do when you arrive is you have the matriculation dinner, which is this very formal dinner, um, you know, where you're, uh, I, I don't think it was black tie, but everybody had to be in their college gowns and, and the rest of it. And there was 
there were all these glasses and all this cutlery and I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what I meant to be using when and I was <laughs> really nervous and confused about it because you know, I just didn't have that kind of background where I, I, I mean, we very rarely even went out to a restaurant, uh, let alone these sorts of really formal dinners. So on that so social side of things, I really struggled. I mean, luckily at that matric dinner, um, the, the fellow who was sitting next to me, he was the French fellow um, uh, for my college. He just said, oh, it doesn't matter, just use what you want. You know, he was quite a chilled out kind of guy who wasn't really into formality himself. Um, so that was okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was just surrounded by people, obviously lots of people who went to private school, lots of people who were used to doing lots of extracurricular activities and threw themselves into it. Whereas again, that was never really ingrained in me culturally or, or by my family to do, you know, lots of sports or other hobbies and things. And I, I look back now and I think actually there were so many opportunities outside of the academic um, sphere to do lo loads of really exciting and fun things at Cambridge and because I, I didn't really sort of have that background of these are some of the things that you ought to be doing or thinking about I, I, I don't feel I fully embrace them I mean I'm not blaming others it's entirely you know, my responsibility I obviously I went to Freshers Fair and things but I didn't it's only once you finish that you realize actually what you could have done um, if you'd use your time more wisely um, and academically, I felt like a complete imposter. I mean, as I say, I was shocked when somebody said to me, you could go to Cambridge. I was even more shocked after I went for the interview and then I got an offer. Um, so shocked to the point that I mentally prepared myself that actually I was really up for going to my insurance place. And then I was a bit disappointed that I wasn't going to uh, Newcastle, which is where I put as my second choice. Mm. Um, and I really felt from day one that I was really thick compared to everybody else. Um, and, I, uh, and so that the whole academic side throughout really stressed me out to be honest and I, I I always it really knocked my confidence because I was just surrounded by really really intelligent people who I, I thought were far far more capable than me and I didn't quite know how I'd ended up in this place yeah and and that's really interesting because there'll be people listening to this thinking you know gosh like from a mental health perspective it'd be probably quite challenging for individuals that maybe we're not used to, you know, the extra quick activities, not used to the whole, you know, going to dinner with your classmates, etc. Did Cambridge support students that, that maybe felt a little bit out of place? Did you feel that actually like you just had to quickly get with the agenda? Or did you feel that actually there was maybe support for students that maybe this was a whole different world? Um, I, I didn't come across personally any specific support. I just you know met people and tried to make friends with people and there was a group that I was trying to hang out with which quite clearly I didn't quite fit with because of you know their interests and how they like to live their lives and and then you know I ended up with a few close friends elsewhere who were sort of more like-minded um but I didn't I I don't recall any specific support I mean it's interesting because there's I went to St. Catherine's College, which is next door to King's College, and King's College was kind of known for taking more from the state school background. So although I went to a grammar school, I went to a state school, not private school. Um, and I don't know whether where, whether somewhere like King's, where they actually were almost known for positively discriminating to make sure they took more people from state school backgrounds rather than private schools, whether, say, somewhere like that, that they had more support. But no, I just sort of... You know, muddled along and, and and tried to find my way really yeah yeah okay no, no and, and 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 obviously did incredibly well so kind of left um cambridge i suppose before we talk about the transition into into ey had you known throughout cambridge what you were planning to do because i appreciate that again you know at university there is a lot of career advice and there is a lot of expectation about you know what graduate job you go and do what yeah. For you personally, did you feel that you always in your mind knew that you'd go into a corporate, you know, run no. with like how no. that, how, how <laughs> you... <laughs> I had, it's one of these classic cases that I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do when I came out of university. Um, so I actually through a lot of school and I'd say the early part of university, I was quite taken with the idea of being a teacher. And obviously having done languages at university, I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll be a languages teacher at secondary school and then having got a bit of a taste of teaching through some volunteering work that I did do briefly while I was at Cambridge 
um, and also in my year abroad in France, I was an assistant in, in a couple of secondary schools in France. I realised this was not my vocation. <laughs> I didn't have the patience or... Really? Or That's quite patience. interesting, okay. <laughs> it's not me. Um, so I, I, I genuinely had no idea when I graduated. All I knew was that, because um, I hadn't taken a, a gap year between school and university, that I wanted to take some time out and go and, and travel and do some voluntary work and then work out what I wanted to do after that. So um, I, I graduated in, in 2000 and then I went off. Actually, I, I, I temped um, for about six months at Goldman Sachs on the trading floor, which was an interesting experience, um, and earned some money to go traveling. Um, and I went off to, to India for a few months to do some voluntary work and um, travel around and try and discover some of my ancestral villages because my, my family from several generations back came from India. Um, and actually, when I was at Goldman's, there was an opportunity to apply for a permanent job. I had no idea whether I really, I didn't know. You know, I didn't necessarily particularly have an interest in banking. I think I was just in this position where I knew that once I came back from my year abroad, for various personal reasons, I was keen to be in a position where I was in a job that paid me enough to move out of home um, and be independent and sort of just yeah uh, live my own life, really. Um, so I didn't have any particular desire to do anything specific. I did, as I say, apply for a job at Goldman's and it didn't come off. And then when I came back from my year abroad, that um, just around the time I was starting to look for jobs was when 9-11 happened. Mm. Um, and um, that was that had quite an impact, obviously, on the jobs market. But I managed to get lucky. And I, I yeah, I was looking at big corporates just because I knew that was a passport to, to be able to move out of home and gain my independence. Um, and I applied to Ernst & Young. Um, I, I don't even remember what the thought process behind it was. It was to join quite a small team where, where they, they uh, supported artists and entertainers. So I ended up going and doing tax returns for um, people like, you know, from, from, from the Beatles and for uh, Greg Rosensky and Stefan Edberg and uh, Simon Cowell and Kylie Minogue and Elton John and such like. So um, that, that was the interesting bit was the clients, not so much the actual work. And um, I ended up only staying for about three years. I did my first set of tax exams. So I was a tax trainee. Mm. rather than accountancy um, and then I was starting to to train for my second set of exams and I was just so bored and I I didn't actually really agree with what I was being trained to do which was to help the very wealthy um, pay as little tax as possible <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was it was around then that I suddenly got really passionate and interested in politics which made me think about changing careers quite radically Mm, yeah and so you kind of kind of yeah you, interesting you, you kind of semi answered my question so it was that point that really yeah. spared the change because I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate you know like you know not that many individuals will go from ey for example into the political space as a direct yeah. move so okay so that that's why okay so coming out of the ey then so obviously you know you kind of caught the political bug because there were various things that EY you didn't necessarily agree with i'm sure that you'd had an interest that various points before yeah, that yeah. in, in I, politics yeah i got interested in politics when i was an a-level student because I, I did french german and politics at right, a-level right, right. um so I'd, I'd got interested then um and had actually joined a political party but hadn't got active um <laughs> and uh, i um when i went to university my first year at university was when blair had his landslide election in 1997 mm -hmm. and i remember sitting in the in the common room um because in those days not everybody had tvs in their room or whatever um with, with 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 friends and other students just amazed i mean even my old constituency of Finchley and golden screen which was Mac margaret thatcher's old constituency mm -hmm. um and which i always thought was rock solid Tory went Labour and I was just you know I was just awestruck yeah, um, yeah. and um, so at that point I, I, I didn't I didn't become active at university like a lot of people do politically uh, and interestingly actually that if I had become active at university who knows what would have ended up happening because you see, we hear about a lot of you know current and former um, 
cabinet ministers being you know very active at, at Oxford or Cambridge and the unions yeah. and, and uh, the Oxford Union. Union and the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I wasn't active at all. I, I partly because Blair won the landslide, and I just thought, oh, finally, the Tories have gone. You know, this is good news. We're okay now, um, <laughs> and, and you know, didn't really feel the need to get active, and then. I um, the reason why I left uh, I got political bug when I was at Ernst and Young it wasn't so much because of what I was doing I mean that was just I was bored and frustrated with that and I was l clearly looking for something else but I that w it was around that time um, 2003 or so that the Iraq War happened um, which uh, and and various things that the Blair government had done which I wasn't very happy about and the, the Iraq War I was like many people very angry about and it um I, I remember clearly a friend turned around and said to me just stop shouting at the telly and actually get up and do something about it yeah, um, yeah. and that's when I joined the Liberal Democrats and um you know decided to scarily take my first step and go to a local party meeting um in uh, my then constituency was Chipping Barnet because I was living in, in sort of Woodside Park on North Finchley Way um and you know it was just a, a, a few a few people uh, and suddenly I found myself on the local party executive um because it was you know it's a tiny little fledgling local party and they saw somebody who could string a sentence together who was under the age of 70 and you know <laughs> get involved please so, um and we then you, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah they had a local council by-election in Mill Hill shortly after I got uh joined up and um so I went out for my first ever experience of canvassing in, in, in Mill Hill in this by-election, which we didn't have a hope of winning, but it was the first time I'd ever done any campaigning. So that's, yeah. um, that's, that's when I became politically active. So that was, that was the end of 2003, did you say? Around? Yeah, it was sort of yeah. late 2003. Yeah. yeah. Um, nice. And then yeah. it was, uh, so that's when I joined up, but I left EY in around March, April 2004, um because although i got I, I i got active and i realized suddenly that this was my passion this was a thing that i was really interested in that i wanted to you know potentially work in um and i through through a conference or event i've been to i met another uh lib dem who i was saying well you know how how can i perhaps go and work for the party um do i in those days it was generally expected that you would have done an internship for an MP, for instance, for free, because in those days nobody paid interns anything, um, or um, you know, lots of volunteering. So I had no experience, and I, I wasn't in a financial position where I could give up my job and just go and work for free. So I applied for a few things, and I just got incredibly lucky. Um, you know, I had a couple of interviews, the second of which came off, and that was although I was hoping to go and work in Westminster for an MP, um, actually um, I ended up uh, going to work in constituency, um, which is where I really learned how to run a campaign because despite the fact that I had no experience, um, I think because I showed some common sense and political nous, um, the, the panel uh, and the, the person from the campaigns department then decided they would hire me and I, in 2005 i was running the campaign for one of the most marginal seats in the country <laughs> having had no previous experience which is quite scary really? um, so, okay. um, yeah so for one term only the liberal democrats had an mp in guildford between 2001 and 2005 her name was sue doughty and uh she had a small majority of 500 and something i can't remember what it was um, so it was a tiny majority and I was hired to uh, organise and run her campaign in, uh, from April 2004 and then the election happened uh, May or June the following year in 2005 and sadly we lost by 347 votes which will be scarred on my soul forever. <laughs> I can um, tell, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, that was a, a painful and bruising experience but it was a great learning experience because that's when I learned really the nuts and bolts of running a campaign you know I was designing and writing all the leaflets and organizing the volunteers in terms of canvassing and delivery and membership engagement I mean everything you name it I was doing it and um, it was a, a really useful learning experience and you know I'm still in touch with lots of the people lots of the key activists that I was working with then 
Yeah. And actually, I think interestingly, you know, regardless of it being the political space or not, the element of failure is probably quite good, right? Because for you, it's a pretty steep learning curve. And I'm sure even today, there'll be things that you remember that will probably help, you know, every, every campaign you go into. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's really, really interesting. So as you say, you know, campaign organizer, you know, had other, you know, you know, roles in the political space. I'm quite interested, you know, so obviously you did a stint working in the kind of office of Nick Clegg. Mm-hmm. What, what was that like? You know, everyone's got their perspective of how they imagined Nick Clegg to be like. Yeah. But, um, but how is it, you know, being there, you know, inside the kind of... So um, I, I only worked for Nick for about six months and he was a relatively new MP when I worked for him. So he'd got elected in the 2005 election and I worked for him in the first half of 2006. Um, and yeah, it was an interesting experience. I had to say on a personal level, I, he's absolutely fabulous. And, and, you know, I, when I, okay, well, not anymore, I don't see him because obviously he's working for Facebook on the other side of the world. But yeah. uh, before that, on the odd occasion when I would bump into him, it was always a joy to, to see him. And um, one of the things I most admire about him and who's left its mark on me is just how devoted a father he was. So at the time, he had three very young sons um and uh he would be really grumpy if he hadn't seen them for more than 24 hours you know he was um really as i say utterly devoted and would you know be going back and forth when we had evening sittings and evening votes he'd he'd be dashing home for bath time and bedtime and then coming back into parliament after that and uh, so on on that personal level uh, he was great Uh, he was a hard taskmaster like many MPs are to work for Um, but um, and it soon became clear to me that if I wanted to pursue a political career in my own right, and when I was working for him was when I got elected as a councillor here in um, Twickenham, um, that actually it was it was quite a tricky balance for me to to work for an MP. You know, where quite often you know, you're expected to be available out of hours and to turn stuff around really quickly, whilst also being a local councillor and then trying to get approved as a parliamentary candidate which is one of the reasons why I only ended up working for him for about six months and then I went to work in the voluntary sector for Save the Children. Yeah yeah okay no and, and, and that's um, be, it's, it's interesting to hear that you know he was such a devout father and that's and, you know, yeah. you know I, I likewise have nothing but good words to say about him I, th- I thought he was, he was really effective and you know robust politician so yeah. uh, okay just, uh, just one more word on Nick Clegg yeah. I mean obviously like loads of people vilify him because of the coalition and I honestly and I'm not just saying this because I'm a Lib Dem because there's plenty of people in my own party who can't stand him I I honestly think from what I know of him that every decision that was made in the coalition he uh, whilst there were some terrible compromises that had to be made that he would not have wanted to make I do think his his heart was genuinely in the right place and he was genuinely trying to do the right thing um and you know i you know, i admire him for that and it was a, it was a big gamble and obviously it's you know, paid off uh, badly but i think a lot of that was down to the communications um yes obviously there were policies that we weren't proud of but um yeah, yeah i i do think he he did it for all the right reasons i don't think he was ever just a, a sort of one of these power hungry people who just wanted to be there for the sake of it yeah yeah and actually uh, there will be people watching you know around around my age where that 2009-10 election was extremely interesting because you know it was extremely marginal no one won the election obviously we'd just been through a recession clearly you know individuals will have their opinion about whether it was the right decision or not i i, I yeah i accept that but uh, yeah like you say actually you know he, i'm sure it came from a good place and in fairness you know history always unfortunately judges junior coalition partners in a certain way we've seen that in multiple countries so um you know people can take their own judgment but no i appreciate from from your perspective as someone that you know knows it quite well you know obviously we wanted to get that on record completely agree um so i suppose after your initial stint of, of politics you then spent you know quite a few years like you say going into um various positions you know you went to save save the children you then had a had a stint at um beating bowel cancer you know you your public relations and public affairs manager yes. you had various kind of um government affairs corporate affairs um you know he- head of government affairs roles um you know you you even got to corporate affairs director for uk and ireland so 
why for you was it quite important to spend quite a few years in that space as opposed to, you know, you've done your political stint. Did you, were you given advice from someone that you should go and actually spend some time, you know, in business or what, what was the kind of perspective of not straight away trying to go into politics as full time then, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, it was, it was a, a bit of a combination of uh, just sort of chance and circumstances and opportunities and when they opened up. So um, actually when I, when I got elected, uh, after I got elected as a councillor here in Twickenham in 2006, um, I quite quickly got approved as a parliamentary candidate and I did go um, for a few selections, I got a few selections for, for a couple of seats. Um, and you know, would have been quite keen to fight a serious seat in 2010. Um, but the couple of selections I did didn't pay off. Um, uh, and in the end, I decided actually that I wanted to uh, stay put um, you know, here in Twickenham. I mean, obviously, I was enjoying being a local councillor and I knew that I would probably have to give that up at some point if I got selected. Um, as it is, I decided to give that up in 2010, partly because of the job I was doing by that point and because I was an approved candidate and I, I had fought an unwinnable seat in 2010 and I just thought, you know, something's got to give and, you know, I love being a councillor and I wanted to serve my constituents to the full, um, but felt that I couldn't quite do that, uh, you know, as well as I should get, with a busy corporate job and also being an approved uh, parliamentary candidate. If I do something, I want to do it well, and I don't like letting people down. So that's why I only ended up running as a councillor for four years. And then, uh, as I say, having fought a couple of selections for more competitive seats and, and lost them, uh, I, was, I was like, okay, I'll chalk that up to experience, fight and un stay where I am, fight an unrunnable seat nearby. And I also got married in that time. Um, and, uh, and then ten came and went, and the, the coalition happened. And then uh, during the coalition, actually, I was on the party's leadership program. So Nick, um, as leader, uh, and various others set up a program to support um, and promote candidates from more diverse backgrounds, um, which I got uh, selected onto. Um, but uh, at that point, um, you know, if I'm being very open, I was wondering whether Twickenham might come up as an opportunity in 2015 um, and uh, it, as it happens it didn't and I, at that point I decided for personal reasons partly because my career was actually developing quite well and I did think uh, and you asked about advice you know there are, you always get lots of different advice of so people saying to me you know go for it we would love to see you in parliament and there were other people who were saying actually you know you've got time on your side you're quite young it's great for you to go and get real life experience whether that's in the charity sector or the corporate sector and I ended up doing both or, or wherever um, to really help inform you and give you you know a richer experience before you go into parliament and I, I loved working at the Martis. Um, uh, I had a great time there it was a great company to work for um, you know they were the developing me and investing in me and so I had loads of opportunities and I moved into a management position um, and that was that that was great because they gave me all the support I needed to suddenly become you know, a manager of people um, and then by that point because you know I was more focused on developing my career rather than necessarily going to find a seat that I could fight um, I we started a family around that time as well and you know by that point I felt actually I don't really you know lots of people there are lots of people in politics who just go hunting for a seat and whilst I probably started out that way um, by the time it came to 2014-2015 I was like no this is where I'm sort of settled and uh, we had our first child in 2014 I thought actually this is where I want to stay put um, and if an opportunity arises here, then so be it, and, and I'll go for it if I'm able to when the time comes. And, and if not, then maybe politics is for later in life. But yeah, so it was just a change of sense, a change of priorities as I developed my career. And actually, I, I really enjoyed being in the corporate world and thrived there and, and was learning a lot. And I thought, well, again, as I say, there's loads of things that I can bring back to the political sphere later in life if, if now is not the right time. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and I suppose now, you know, with hindsight, looking back at that period of time, do you yeah. think that actually it kind of positively impacts the way that you think as a politician? Because clearly, you know, you'd spent quite a long period of time in business. So now I suppose you understand on the other side, you know, when businesses come to you, et cetera, talking about their challenges, obviously you spend that time in various management positions. So I suppose, does it positively help you in any way, would you say? Alex. Oh, sorry, I think I lost you for a minute. You, you, you completely froze and I, I missed all of that question. Oh, did you? <laughs> sorry. No, no, not to worry. Yeah. I was just, I was yeah, just you, thinking... you froze up a Oh, okay. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Yeah, okay. Just just looking back then over that period of time, would you say that, that that's actually positively helped your political mindset because of the, you know, the amount of time that you'd spent in business? You know, I suppose lots of people, the one negative that they have to say about politicians is they're career politicians and they're never, they've never done anything else but being being you know politics so is i suppose your perspective it must be different now right yeah yeah i mean there's loads of learning that i bring from the corporate world not not just from novartis then but also subsequently uh, in my, my latest role before i came into parliament was working for merck a german company and i did do a brief stint in between the two companies in the public sector which uh was frustrating to say the least um and uh so yeah I, I mean along the way you always i think you know whatever you do in life you always take experiences and learning from everything that you do into the next yeah. thing that you do and i think um actually uh, what one of the things that uh, a lot of mps struggle with so you know you've got the whole parliamentary side of things you've got the constituency side of things um but uh mps are essentially operating as like almost like small businesses or self-employed where uh, um where they are also employing several members of staff and you know you've got to build and develop and motivate a team um and that side of things is often neglected in politics which is why you often hear about really bad uh, examples of how people are treated who work for politicians and I think the good thing about people like me and, and a number of other uh, contemporaries you know new MPs in my cohort have just come in um, is that coming from that you know whether it's a business or, or voluntary sector background where you've had that 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 rigorous training and management experience um, means that some of that side of things that in terms of and say how you uh, how you treat people how you manage people um how you deal with difficult decision making um as well i think uh, some of the experience in business really helps with that as well as also just seeing the reality of how business runs day to day you know I, I, uh, my last job before i came into parliament i was sitting at sort of the equivalent of board level at uk level across the um company um three different businesses and uh, across their many sites as well as um you know for the leaks in, on the senior leadership team for one of the three businesses that uh, make up Merck um and and just seeing uh the pressures and the challenges and and the way government policy plays out frankly day to day uh in terms of its impact on the business and how it operates and how it responds is obviously very instructive when you then go to parliament as well as clearly the network is quite useful um mm. and given that two of the companies i work for were, were, were largely pharmaceutical companies uh, and i've now got the health brief you know when we're talking about vaccines and treatment and, and diagnostic development for COVID-19 um, is really useful but I've got contacts that I can who I know are, are well informed in that area to pick up the phone to and say well help me to understand this or you know what does this mean in terms of vaccines etc so um, that's all really useful. So it's come in use yeah no and that's and that's super interesting and I suppose there'll be, there'll be people now naturally that are very interested in politics but having to make that tough decision about you know whether or not they focus on politics and that's that's the career from, from day dot or whether actually they do something a little bit different for a period of time knowing that, that will be beneficial so I think it's pretty interesting to hear, to hear your story so okay so obviously you talked about you know the, the perspective of 
you know, fighting some some seats and, and not and not winning and, and knowing that for, for Twickenham and for Southampton, you obviously wanted to really wait for that to become available. So, you know, you, you obviously in your, you know, your corporate affairs director role, you know, how long before Vince decided to resign? Or what was the process around you being kind of notified that actually there might be a perspective of you getting into the potential parliamentary candidate for Twickenham? Like, what was that process like? I'm quite interested. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my, well, obviously there was, there was the 2015 election where we, we didn't expect to lose Vince and we lost Vince. And then after that, I was thinking, okay, at some point I'm going to have to give, give some thought to him if Vince decides he's not going to run again, am I going to go for it? And when we knew there was a 2017 election coming after the referendum, um, I did decide to throw my hat in the ring, but said, obviously, if Vince is running, clearly I'm not going to uh, try and uh, go up against Vince. And it yeah. turned out Vince wanted to go for it again, so that's fine. Um, and then ended up um, having our, our second child in 2018. And so I came to the conclusion having two children and having a really busy, challenging day job uh, um, that probably i don't any time soon um and i very much put it on the back burner it's just not physically possible when you, you know i was the main breadwinner in the family doing a really big busy job uh you know often staying away overnight two young children at home um I, there's just no way i could fit in being a parliamentary candidate so yeah it was just uh, just being in the right place at the right time and how circumstances happen that um obviously with with a potential election on the horizon in 2019 when it was becoming clearer and clearer with brexit deadlock in parliament that we were almost certainly going to end up in another general election um it, i you know wondered it was obvious to me that we would have to have a very quick selection and the party move to start selecting candidates over the summer period mm -hmm. with the expectation that there might be an election in the autumn or in january and so at that point, uh, you know, I was at that point with work where I was at the end of the road with that current role and I was talking to my company about changing roles within the company and looking at the, my, my next opportunity. Um, so I was already sort of getting itchy feet and, you know, clearly Brexit was doing and, you know, had kind of made me uh, want to, to get back on the front line politics and you know, I, I went and had a candid chat with Vince and said look if there is an election in the autumn or in January do you think you're going to run again because by this point he'd already said if the if the parliament ran its full length of five years to 2022 he wouldn't stand again yeah um um uh, but but then because he was leader he was saying well if there's a snap election i will but by this point he was no longer leader and he said oh, probably not so i thought well okay then i had to make a personal decision you know with my family as to okay if there is a snap election and um, a quick selection and then a quick election can i go for it and it was only really in those very narrow circumstances that i felt in practical and financial terms that i could do it uh, and that's why i i went for it and um so he announced publicly over the summer that he wasn't going to run again there was a very very quick selection that was run in two weeks normally selections go on for sort of four a minimum of four more like six weeks yeah. um and uh i have very supportive and uh helpful employer as i say i was in this latest position where where I was kind of started to transition out of my old role and looking at a variety of new roles. So I got selected. They were actually quite accommodating about me going part time um, because I reached the end of the road with this role. Um, so I quickly dropped part time, and thankfully we were in a financial position for me to do that for a few weeks. And then the election was called, um, and I took some paid leave for them. And then suddenly I found myself a parliament with a new job. So um, it was a very unusual process. And um, you know, I, I'm happy to say this openly, and I've said this to others, if it had been a 2022 election with the party selecting the candidate Twickenham probably around now, earlier this year, for a two year run into an election, there's no way I could have run for it because being a candidate in a seat like this for two or three years is a huge 
unpaid commitment which when you've got a big day job and a young family you just can't do so i was i was very fortunate in the in the timing uh, of how the process ran yeah and, and and that's a really interesting point because i think unfortunately what isn't spoken about is the reality of the situation of politics can sometimes be extremely demanding you, you know you can be asked to take unpaid you know work you know be a politician candidate for a period of time and obviously clearly you know actually some families or some individuals it just doesn't work so i suppose that actually is a pretty important lesson to know that you know it has to work for you to really put yourself into that position of being a parliamentary candidate for a few months potentially great or actually potentially a few years where everything else is kind of put to the back burner so that's yeah that's a really really interesting um point of discussion so going through the election you know obviously for for a very contentious seat like like twickenham but obviously historically has always been kind of a live down tory battle how did you find that? Yeah. You know, I appreciate that, you know, when, when you are fighting a seat that maybe isn't as winnable as, say, Twickenham, for example, I appreciate that maybe, you know, you want to do your best, but, you know, the pressure is not necessarily on. But for, for you taking on, you know, parliamentary candidate role for, for seat Twickenham, very, very winnable, you know, the expectation is there. How, how did you feel? Because I, I can appreciate that would have been quite a tough thing to take on with, you know, a snap election. Yeah. Um... It was, uh, it was quite a big responsibility because, as you say, everybody just assumed it was in the bag. Um, and yeah. being a Liberal Democrat, I know that nothing is ever in the bag. It doesn't <laughs> matter what the fact of the majority is. There is no such thing as a Liberal Democrat safe seat. So never for one minute did it take anything for granted. Um, and also the other big thing for me was stepping into Vince's shoes because you know Vince Cable absolute legend um, and both through the selection the internal party selection and then the election itself when I was out talking to people on the doorstep you know member after member in the selection and voter after voter in the election it's just like oh you've got big shoes to fill <laughs> uh, and that was if I had a pound for the number of times I heard that I would be a very rich woman that would have funded my campaign easily um, sure. and so I had this kind of weight of expectation on me um, of you know he clearly he's intellectual giant you know economist you know all these things that you know I'm not an economist I'm certainly not an intellectual giant um, but you know you just got to come to terms with that and be at peace with the fact that you know he and I've got different strengths and weaknesses um, but yeah, as you say, the huge expectation that I would uh, hold the seat. Um, and, you know, I, w I was very fortunate that actually, because it is, we've got a really strong local council base here, uh, loads of Lowdown councillors right across the constituency. Um, we had a fantastic paid campaign manager who worked across the borough, uh, Alice, who is hugely experienced, one of the most talented uh, campaigners in the party. Mm -hmm. I also happen to be married to a professional campaigner um, who is a great strategist, but also brilliant at um, writing and designing and artworking leaflets. Um, so, you know, I had a, a great base here. Um, mm -hmm. We, like many other local parties, we had loads of new members, not, all, not many of not a lot of them have been mobilized but you know one of the challenges for me was Vince had his sort of group of key activists who worked with him in most elections and they were retiring with him uh, and I had to very quickly pull a good team together to support me um, and I was just very fortunate among some of our newer people who only really got involved I'd say after the referendum some of them um, you know the they stepped up to the plate and uh, got involved and, and helped drive the, the, the election campaign. Um, and then, you know, it was obvious to me when I was out door knocking through the campaign um, uh, that it looked reasonably okay. Um, and I did start to feel more and more confident. And then it got to the point when we were seeing the polls elsewhere around the country through the campaign where I felt we actually we need to start sending people out now from Twickenham because I could sense that actually we were going to bring it home and I felt a real sense of responsibility that we needed to help others win because I didn't want to be part of a really small group in Parliament um, and I think because of the way unfortunately the campaign played out and it became increasingly clear that we were going to 
do pretty badly um uh, that the there was a fear even in strong seats like Twickenham to send people out too quickly and it was really only in the last sort of week 10 days that we were proactively sending activists out some would had peeled away anyway because they could see it was looking reasonably positive and with the prospect of possibly taking out Dominic Raab just next door in East Hamilton um, and Wimbledon down the road where we were we were targeting heavily. People had organically started to do that, um, but I was keen that we proactively tried to support other seats. Um, but yeah, it was it was a big deal coming into it. But thankfully, given by my professional experience in the party, but having run a couple of campaigns, I, I didn't mention that I did uh, stand in 2012 as for the London Assembly as well for um, the Lib Dems for. Southwest London seat, which covers three London boroughs, so right. it, you know it's not like a general election, but it was a big campaign uh, where I had to build a team and raise money and quick, you know, get people out in the middle of the coalition for an election that people don't care about, which is right. really hard going. So it was yeah. drawing on all that experience, but also as I say, my personal experience of building a team and finding the right talents and mix of people to compliment I'm not the details of the process per damn to see would be frozen again. Hmm. Yeah, and that's still with me, Alex. No, I am sorry, there's just oh, you're, there's sorry, a little you're bit <laughs> But no, no, and that's and that's really really interesting. And again, you know, the, the, there will be individuals that that will find that that story pretty interesting. So, going through the campaign, then, and obviously, you you, you kind of sensed that it was going to be, you know, relatively okay. You know, you, you kind of weighed up the numbers in the area, and, and, and I kind of thought, okay, I, I feel pretty confident. Had you going into election night, was there anything that you were still nervous about, or or had you known by that point that you were, you know, pretty confident? Because I appreciate that, you know, like you say, nothing's kind of safe in politics and going into an election night i appreciate that you know there can be <laughs> some weird last minute shifts in public opinion uh because of the media social media etc so were you pretty confident or were you still a little bit nervous a little bit worried about what the outcome could be um i think i was reasonably confident about twickenham um i you know was slightly nervous about richmond Park because we were trying to welcome that back, and we were very clear as a, a borough wide local party that wanted to make sure we won that. I think I was probably more nervous about the wider picture, and to be honest, I just I felt physically horrendous. So, um, just to bring the human aspect of this into play, um, the, the the night before the election uh, and the night before that, my two children who are uh, one and five respectively uh, decided to get ill and get norovirus so one night one of them was being sick through the night the next night the other one was being sick through the night I was absolutely petrified I was going to get ill and I thought being up on the podium when my election result is announced and being sick is probably not a good look so I was kind of <laughs> praying I didn't get whatever they had yeah um, so I was massively Sleep deprived. Obviously, I was physically spent from the campaign and knocking on doors, and we did about seven public hustings or so. Um, uh, and frankly, I was just dead, and I, and I was feeling sick with nerves, and because I hadn't eaten very much, and I was terrified that this was norovirus. So, to be honest, more than anything, I was just hoping I'd get through the count without falling over or being sick. <laughs> um, and, ditto, uh, and ditto Michael, my husband, who, as I say, was was an integral member of the campaign team and um, had been sort of overseeing the, the, the polling day operation locally and then had gone to the count to oversee the count operation. Um, and both of us were petrified we we're going to get ill. And you know, my poor in-laws were at home looking after these sick children. <laughs> just, so, frankly, that's what I was dealing with on election night more than anything else. <laughs> God, God. And you know what? I, I'm really happy that you mentioned that because actually it's pretty clear that it can be a really bru br like bruising and tough experience running for yeah. Parliament. Clearly, you know, I'm sure there are a hundred more stories if we had more time that you would talk about. But clearly, you know, 
the whole notion, not just getting out of the public and having to obviously face individuals that might disagree with you, but how tiring, obviously, it must be the hours. And, and you know, it's, it's, I can't really think of other things that are, are similar to it. So, um, yeah, like, like you say, actually, you were just pretty, pretty pleased to get through it in one piece. So, obviously, you know, you're up there, you're hearing, you know, the election result. I'm sure you're, you know, you're massively chuffed. You know, what happens then? Because I suppose lots of people watching this for, for individuals that become a new MP, I'm sure it must be an absolutely, you know, mad experience because clearly you've gone through, gone through the election campaign just trying to win. And now, you know, you've, you've been announced as the MP for Twickenham, you know, you're obviously having to be, you know, enrolled into parliament, etc. I'm sure it must have been a, you know, a really crazy time, right? During that, during that period. Just, uh, just a word on the on the result. I knew before I went to the count what the result was, pretty much. So it's not oh, like really? it was okay. a shock to me. Podium, so oh, okay. Like, so you had to, but you still had to have that shocked face. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't know the exact result. But, yeah. Um, one of the reasons why each political party sends some of their people into the count is to to take to look at samples of each box when it gets opened up. And my right. my agent called me at about eleven o'clock to say, "Look, you're home and dry. You're all right." So I managed to then get a couple of hours sleep before I went to the count. Um, <laughs> but sorry, yeah. So uh, you were saying about being a new MP and how how that was. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was. Uh, total whirlwind i mean i was so spaced out as you say physically and emotionally the election campaign is absolutely draining um and then i thankfully i didn't get norovirus but both my husband and my in-laws who were staying with us to help with childcare, all got ill the day after the election so i was kind of dealing with the domestic side of things and then tried to take the saturday off because obviously the election was thursday that happened friday um everyone was ill saturday i took off and then sunday i actually went into parliament on sunday because as a new mp they were starting the induction process over the weekend um because uh, obviously the election was all fought on brexit and getting brexit done in johnson's words um so the government had arranged for every they they wanted MPs straight into Parliament on the Monday and starting to get the Brexit legislation through before Christmas because obviously it was very close to Christmas by this point um, and the Monday was only one week before Christmas Eve um, so it was it was quite surreal going into Westminster on Sunday I, I did the, the Sunday politics show um, in Broadcasting House first thing in the uh, morning and then went into Westminster to get my pass and get my laptop it was like you know a bit like first day in a new job slash a bit like Freshers Fair and turning up to university <laughs> or, or starting a new school you know and you, the, at that point they hadn't allocated offices so they gave us a key for like a locker type thing where we could leave our stuff and um you know, get your security briefing i met the speaker lindsay hoyle he happened to be there in his jeans wandering around talking to some of the new mps as we arrived so that was nice yeah, yeah. Got self um, <laughs> and, uh, so that was but so that was all great and we were still like a bit rabbit in headlights and then uh the first week in parliament you, you just barely your feet barely touch the ground because um you know apart from anything that was going on within the chamber the media had huge amounts of interest in all these new mps turning up so i found myself doing sky interviews and bbc news 24 interviews and radio 5 live and various others uh and sort of running from pillar to post and then you know there were issues that had come up in the campaign that some of which were urgent and you know, needed addressing immediately um and we were in the middle of a strike with southwestern railway and uh i managed to go and meet yeah. the union you know, so it was just like a full-on intense first week yeah um cool. and there was already engagements in my diary the following weekend for christmas because obviously it was right up Close just before Christmas, uh, and then the Monday, I think after that, I did my first constituency surgery, and then I went off for a Christmas break, and I managed to actually get a few days sleep. I got really ill because um, I my body finally gave in and said, right, you, you know, you got high temperature, horrible cold. I was in bed for a couple of days, but I needed that to be honest. Yeah, sure. I managed to have a few days off at Christmas, and then it's been full on again ever since. I mean, it was. 
the, the intensity and the pace, despite having done big demanding corporate jobs, the intensity and the pace uh, and the relentlessness of it is like nothing I've ever known. Mm. Um, and that was before coronavirus. And then when coronavirus hit, my goodness, yeah, it's just it's ridiculous. I mean, most days are sort of 15 hour days um, and anywhere between 12 and 15 hours. Uh, and uh, it's only the last few weekends where I've actually managed to have a little bit of downtime at weekends, but otherwise it's been seven days a week full on um, with uh, coronavirus. Yeah, yeah. Baptism of fire. Everybody thought, okay, well, now that Brexit's sorted, there's such a massive majority. It's actually going to be quite a quiet parliament. Yeah, downtime, yeah, yeah. Nobody thought well, we're suddenly going to be caught up in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, it's just yeah. insane. Yeah, and, and obviously, yeah, you mentioned before, obviously, how demanding it's been on you and, and, and other MPs. So, yeah, I suppose my question was really going to be then, you know, there will be people watching the, you know, I, from the outside in, it's obviously easy to assume what you think the most difficult thing about being a member of parliament is. But for obviously for you being a member of parliament, what, what would you say is the, the toughest thing? I appreciate it's difficult to narrow it down into one, but if you had to pick one thing, like, what, what would you say is the difficult thing about being an MP? Um, I think the thing that stresses me out the most is when when constituents think that I'm not working hard for them. Um, mm. we, uh, because the problem is, is that you, as an MP, you don't, you can only employ so many staff, but most of us have got very small teams because parliamentary allowances are, are, are limited. Um, and you, when you just get getting hundreds of emails, even outside of coronavirus, you know, MPs' inboxes are just overwhelmed all the time. With coronavirus, it's been literally thousands of thousands of emails. Mm. Um, and there's only so quickly that you can respond to them. Um, uh, and, you know, if, if, you know, if, for whatever reasons, for internal sort of staffing reasons stuff doesn't get done as quickly as you might like or stuff gets missed because you know everyone's human and, and that happens um and then when i sometimes i get you know a really shirty email or tweet sort of saying you know our silent inactive mp who's doing nothing when i was sort yeah. of working more through the night I, I, I really struggle with that because, uh, you know, I try my best and at the end of the day, we're all only human. Um, and, you know, occasionally I like to see my young children and my husband uh, if I can. And so um, yeah, I know it seems a strange thing to pick, but, you know, one of the things that I feel passionately that every MP should be doing is serving their community. That's what we're there to do is to serve my community and my country that's why I wanted to be an MP um, and I try my very very hardest to always put my constituents first ahead of whatever I need to do at a sort of Westminster level with my national uh, hat on um, but you know just sometimes I just either you know can't help them or I just we physically just can't help them quickly enough and and I, I struggle with that. Yeah. Um, but there just aren't enough hours in the day for me or my staff. Um, so there's just not enough staff to deal with the volume of stuff that we get as MPs. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, as, uh, from an outsider perspective, obviously it's, it's always pretty easy to criticise and, and naturally MPs always get the brunt of criticism on, on everything, you know, from whether or not, you know, the MP turned up to vote or, you know, whether they responded to this email or, or whatever. So, yeah, I can... That's, that's actually really, really interesting. I'm sure a lot of people probably will understand why that, that frustrates you so much. So, okay, so I suppose I'll, I'll try and wrap up because, um, you know, we've had a really, really interesting conversation and I really do appreciate your time in here. I know it's Saturday evening, so I'll try and wrap up. So um, I've been asking all of my guests, and this is quite a tough question, but if I had to drop you in an island, oh my you're, you're only allowed to take three things. Now, they can be three humans or three physical things. What would the what would the three things be uh, and and why? We've had some interesting answers, but uh, but I have oh, to really? ask you as one of my guests. <laughs> oh, I was going to I was going to give you a really boring answer. And I said, <laughs> because when you, when you said I can take three humans, then clearly I would take my husband and two children. Just like, oh. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, as a mother, I couldn't abandon my children if you dropped me on an island and and 
you know, my, my husband's a primary carer. I, I'm not very good at looking after the children. He tells me <laughs> he what to do. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I kind of, I go nuts without him. So, you know, he, I'd have, have to take the family. Yeah. I'm, so I'm afraid you're not going to get a really interesting, spicy answer from me. <laughs> Given that you gave me. You gave me the option of taking humans as no I did, I did, I did, I did. Yeah. All right, just out of interest then, if you had to take, say, three items with your family then, oh, goodness. What, what, what would they be? Um, that's a really tough question. <laughs> um, Am I allowed? Uh, am I allowed to have devices? <laughs> I need to you are allowed devices. Control. Yeah, yeah. So I probably at least have to take my phone, if if, if not my laptop, because at least with my phone I can speak to people as well as you know find information and and work out what's going on in the world. Yeah. That has to be on the remote phone. island. I love that. <laughs> uh, I'd I'd probably take my Bible with me. Um, okay. Just um, that's important to me. Yeah. Um, and if I if I had to take any food stuff with me, um, uh, going back to my Indian roots, it's got to be rice. Can't live without my rice. Really? But that's that's <laughs> I like that answer though, because actually rice rice can be very filling, and actually you can put stuff with it. So. That's yeah, actually yeah, a really, yeah. really good answer. I, I think a lot, some people have said to me things like, you know, chocolate, but like, you know, I don't know how long that would last, but yeah, that's uh, a that's, uh, really, really interesting. I can't, I can't go for very long without rice. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you'd have to take it. Yeah, no. That, <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I buy these massive 10 kilo bags when I buy rice, right? Because, <laughs> Which 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 Asian family doesn't? I mean, I know I'm from, my husband's not Asian, but I do quite a lot of uh, Indian cooking, and yeah, rice is important to me. Is it? Yeah. Well, yeah. you can have your rice. So, <laughs> thank you very much. I think um, I'm yeah. nuts now. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Mino. I really appreciate. No, it. thank you. <laughs> the good chat. The good chat. Thanks, Mino. Yeah.